timing. So let's uh, just jump right into it. So with the current progress in AI and multi-agent systems, it is now important to direct these advances towards societal benefits. And I'll focus on three areas, public safety and security, conservation and public health. And in all of these areas, viewing these societal problems as multi-agent systems, we focus on a key research challenge, how to optimize our limited intervention resources when interacting with other agents in these domains. So when we talk about public safety and security, we have the limited resources of the security resources. We have a large number of targets to protect limited security resources, how to schedule or plan or allocate these resources, taking into account a watchful adversary. We've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States and internationally. With respect to conservation, the challenge is we have large conservation areas to protect limited range of resources. Here we've contributed a new model called Green Security Games. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda for the past several years. Taking into account past poaching data, we are able to predict where poachers may set traps or snares. And for the past several years, then remove a large number of snares and even get poachers arrested. Finally, with public health, the challenge is we have a limited number of social worker resources. Concrete example here is work we have done in homeless shelters in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of homeless youth, we are able to show that our AI influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading information about HIV compared to traditional approaches. More recently, as Manuela mentioned, uh, I've taken over as the director for AI for Social Good at the new AI research lab that Google established in Bangalore. So we ha held a workshop a couple months ago, and out of that workshop came out six projects that we are actively pursuing. I'm not gonna be able to describe them in a whole lot of depth, but each of them is with a different NGO. For example, Arman uh, is an NGO that focuses on health of babies and mo young mothers. Uh, Cushy Baby is another one that also focuses on health of babies. Uh, in conservation, uh, Wildlife Conservation Trust, for example, focuses on human wildlife conflict and others. And so we are eagerly pushing this forward, and hopefully we'll be able to start reporting on the results of these in the next few months to come. But as we see all of these projects, there'll be three themes that will cut across them. First, multi-agent systems reasoning, that's my area of work, in particular use of game theory and social networks. But all of this is embedded within a data to deployment pipeline. By that I mean, it's very important for us as we work on AI for social good to actually visit the sites where work is being deployed, sometimes in remote communities, to understand the challenges firsthand, understand what kind of data are available. This emergent teaches us, uh, gives us the kind of data that we want. Following that, a predictive model then makes predictions of which cases are high risk versus low risk. But we have limited resources, so we can't intervene on all high risk cases. So a prescriptive algorithm then, usually this multi-agent systems reasoning algorithm, tells us which cases to actually intervene on. And following that, field test and deployment and this is important because by testing things in the field, we can understand what are the weaknesses of our models and algorithms. I wanted to make two quick points about uh, this data to deployment pipeline. The first being field testing is important not only because it tells us what are weaknesses of our algorithms, but we are working on AI for social impact. And it is important to actually achieve social impact. We can't say it's AI for social impact and stop by writing a paper about it. Secondly, you know, we've always been told there's a lot of data, we, are all, we all have big data, but in all of these domains, there is not this big data, but rather a lack of data. And so we constantly have to fight sparsity of data. And you'll see that struggle throughout all of these projects. Finally, all of this work is only possible because of the interdisciplinary partnerships with governmental and non-governmental organizations. And to establish these, we've really patrolled with the U.S. Coast Guard on their boats in this port of New York, really patrolled with wildlife conservation agencies in forests in Malaysia and Cambodia. We've spent time in homeless shelters in Los Angeles so that we can understand user needs and understand challenges they truly face. So with this, uh, let me get into 
the outline for this presentation. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of about 14, 15 years of the work we've done, starting with public safety and security. Uh, this is the earliest part of our work, and I'll go through this rather quickly, focusing more on the more recent work in conservation and public health. And so all of the work has been published in top AI conferences, AMAS, AAA, IHK, and others. There you'll see a lot of simulation results and formal models and so forth. Here I'll focus more on the real world evaluation. If you are interested in following up on this more, there are these three books, each on one of these topics, which are edited books. If you buy these, then from the royalties, I can take my students out to a nice dinner. <laughs> um, but uh, to really acknowledge the contributions of our students and postdocs, I'll put pictures of uh, the student who led the project in the top right-hand corner of the work where, uh, on the slides where the work will be shown. So let's start with public safety and security. So this work started uh, in 2007 when the chief of airport police at the time, Errol Southers, approached us to improve security at the LAX airport. His challenge was somebody driving a suicide truck into one of the terminals, as happened in Glasgow. There are eight inbound roads into the airport, but not enough officers to have checkpoints on all roads at all times. Eight terminals, not enough dogs to be everywhere. So the question is, where and when do you set up checkpoints? Where and when do you canine patrols? The question for us was, could we propose game theory as a way of optimizing these limited resources? Could we convince scientific advisory committees that this was the right approach? Could we convince our AI reviewers that this was the right approach? And could we convince the sergeants on the ground that this was the right approach? But that's what we decided to do, and we built a new model called Stackelberg Security Games. I'm going to explain it using this two-by-two toy example. So here we have one police unit trying to protect two terminals, and there's one adversary. And you could imagine that the defender knowing Terminal 2 is more important always trying to protect Terminal 2. Now an adversary conducting surveillance will attack Terminal 1. The adversary gets a positive reward of 5. The police get a negative reward minus 5. If as a result the police were to switch and say we'll always protect Terminal 1, an adversary conducting surveillance will now attack Terminal 2. The adversary again gets a positive reward. The police again get a negative reward. So any deterministic strategy the adversary could defeat. If the police were to use a randomized strategy, a mixed strategy, 60% of the time they're at Terminal 1, 40% at Terminal 2, an adversary conducting surveillance will only know that the police are there 60%, here 40%, what they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. So these kinds of games are called Stackelberg games because defender commits first to a randomized strategy, the adversary observes and then responds. These are security games where they are played on targets, and the payoffs are based on estimates of losses that may occur in terms of lives lost, for example. Now, we are optimizing the limit, use of limited resources. We are not guaranteeing 100% security because in re the real world there is no such thing. We are increasing the cost or uncertainty to an adversary in coming up with a plan of attack. So this is how we built the armor system at LAX. We start with the game matrix, the payoffs coming from loss of human lives and other estimates. This is fed into a mixed integer program that produces a mixed defender strategy. For example, the probability that there's a canine patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 2, 5, and 6 is 0.517. Probability there's a canine patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 3, 5, and 7 is 0.33. And then we sample from this distribution to generate an actual schedule. So for example, at 8 a.m., send team 1 to terminal 2, team 3 to terminal 5, team 5 to terminal 6. At 9 a.m., do something different. And this is the actual schedule that the police officers get, and then they execute this. So I'll briefly go into the mixed integer program just to give you a, a sense of how uh, this program was written. And so we are trying to maximize defender expected utility. RIJ here refers to the reward to the defender if the defender takes a strategy I and the adversary takes a strategy J. XI is the probability with which we take a strategy I. So X1 is the probability there's a dog on terminal 1 and a dog on terminal 2. X2 is the probability there's a dog on terminal 1 and dog on terminal 3. So for every single combination of defender resources to target, we generate a probability variable. This works. For the simple, for the small domain, it's hard to scale up, and I'll come to how we did that a little bit later, that scale up. We model the fact that the adversary gets to observe our mixed strategy, our randomized strategy, and then chooses a particular terminal to attack. And so this is uh, adversary's best response to our mixed strategy. So 
with this program written and everything in place, and there's a lot more that went on for many months to make it all work, and I'm not going to go into some of those details. Armor was operational at LAX Airport. It's the first such application of computational game theory for operational security. And there's a lot of news surrounding this event and reports of weapons captures going into the airport, like in January of 2009, all these weapons uh, being captured going into the airport. So this led uh, to floodgates opening in terms of other security agencies looking to use game theory to operationalize to improve uh, their operations. But one challenge we faced was that how to scale up these games to be able to solve large-scale games. So if you have 1,000 targets in 20 guards, for example, suddenly the game had 10 to the power 41 different strategies, 10 to the power 41 different rows as shown here. And if you just fed it into our armor program, the program would quietly die, running out of memory. So we needed a different approach. And so this was done by um, using these iterative models. So you start with a small game matrix, and there's some iterative process that tells us what's the next, next best row to add, the next best defender strategy to add. And you iterate in this fashion until you converge to a global optimal, but without expanding 10 to the power 41 strategies. So you only may expand 1,000 strategies and still achieve a global optimal. So this is how we built a number of uh, other applications. And so we started with Armour at the LX Airport, Irish for the Federal Air Marshals. If you are on a US Air Carrier, American Delta, United, etc., whether there was an Air Marshal or not on your flight internationally may have been decided by this program. Protect, which was to generate patrols in different ports, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, so forth, um, including around the Staten Island Ferry, and the list goes on. Each of these ended up in Congress. So for example, in 2000, uh, 2008 or 9, Errol Southers talked about armor uh, in your uh, congressional committee hearing. LAX is safer today than it was 18 months ago. A team of research led by Dr. Malen Tambe worked with our department to develop armor. This software randomizes our vehicle checkpoints along airport access roads and the deployment of our explosives detection canine teams throughout the airport. And uh, other such, uh, I guess that one disappeared, but anyway, other such uh, hearings as well. But of course, you know, you sort of uh, put that in a paper, oh, our, our work got cited in a congressional committee hearing, but uh, reviewer two is not impressed. And so usually that means, uh, you know, you really have to go and understand things in more detail and do real world testing. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to evaluate things in practice to show that security games approaches are superior in optimizing limited resources compared to human schedulers or other simple random approaches. For example, uh, we spent time trying to figure out fair evaders on trains in Los Angeles is a challenge. So LA Sheriff's Department does randomized checks. So we could use a game theoretic approach to do these checks versus their baseline strategy. And so we sent officers trying to look for fare evaders on trains for 21 days, sometimes using a game theoretic approach, sometimes using this baseline approach. They didn't know which one was which. And at the end of the period, try and understand who did a better job. And our results were that the game theoretic approach were successful in capturing 60% more fare evaders compared to their baseline approach. And there's many other such real world evaluations that we did. Uh, some came out naturally, for example, at the LAX airport from before to arm, uh, before armor was deployed to after, the numbers of arrests jumped fivefold. So uh, all of this just to show that the security games are indeed more effective in optimizing limited resources compared to traditional approaches. So this security games approach then led us into wildlife protection and conservation. So this came out of a trip. Uh, I was in Uganda. This is Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. And this is, uh, there's wonderful wildlife there. And these are my pictures from, from the trip. But there's also threats to the wildlife, snares or traps that are used to maim and kill animals. And in fact, thousands of these traps that are used every year to kill these animals. As you know, uh, illegal wildlife trade is a five or six billion dollar industry. And so how can we optimize the use of limited range of resources? So we've come up with this new model called green security games. 
And so let's take the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. Now we divide it up into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square. And so now each grid square is a target where there's water, for example, more animals, therefore a more important target. And we could imagine at first we would solve it just like we did with armor with this mixed integer program. However, it doesn't work like that because we are not here working against a fully strategic adversary, but instead many multiple boundedly rational poachers. So they're not going to provide this best response. Instead, we are going to learn the adversary's bounded rational response from past data. For each grid location I, we are going to, based on past ranger patrol frequency and different features, understand the probability of finding a snare in each grid cell. And so this function GI then can be used to optimize our ranger patrols. So we're trying to learn what, with what probability the rangers are going to attack each grid cell. We got 12 years of past poaching data from Uganda. Uh, this had things like range of patrol frequency in each grid cell, animal density, distance to roads, rivers, and so forth. And now uh, it, we face one challenge in trying to predict the snares. When the rangers report they found a snare in a grid cell, yes, they found a snare, it's reported. When they say that they didn't find a snare, it could just be that they didn't walk enough in that grid cell. If they just had walked a little bit more, maybe they could have found that snare. So when we have a positive instance, a snare found, we trust that. But when we have a negative instance, we are not sure. And so we have some kind of a positive and unlabeled data set. And so to deal with that, we came up with the ensemble model, which used many different uh, filtered data sets. So for example, one filtered data set here says, we are not going to trust any negative instances reported where the rangers have walked less than one kilometer in the grid cell, and then learn a classifier for that. In another, we are going to throw out all data where the rangers have reported a negative instance when they have walked less than two kilometers per grid cell, and learn a classifier for that. And so we learn a range of such classifiers, and then in the end, generate an ensemble so that, for example, when in the test case, you have less than two kilometers walked, you use two of these classifiers, and so forth. So we generated this uh, set of classifiers. We showed our results in the lab are excellent compared to traditional uh, you know, machine learning models that we achieve higher accuracy on past poaching data. Everything papers published, uh, everything is excellent. But our partners, Wildlife Conservation Society and Uganda Wildlife Authority, uh, are not happy. They want to see an actual test on the ground. So 2016, uh, we did this test. We said, OK, we are going to give you two new nine square kilometer areas, which were infrequently patrolled. Well, you haven't found snares before. So we're not asking you to go back to where you had found uh, snares or traps before. And so these are the two areas. And these are the uh, these green dots are where we are asking them to patrol. The red dots are where former, uh, previously snares were found. So we're not asking them to go back to where they had found these snares earlier. And this was done one month before a conference deadline so that if we find snares, we will be able to write a paper. And if there's no snares, there's no paper. So this is a high stakes game for everybody. And rangers went out to patrol, so every day they would go out and send us an email, what happened today? Initially, there was nothing. But then came a sad news that they had found a poached elephant with its tusk cut off. So this was sad news. It was, we were too late for this elephant, but at least we were being pointed to in the right direction. Then a whole elephant snare roll was found and removed. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants. But before they could kill the next set of elephants, we were able to remove this elephant snare roll and hopefully save lives of elephants. And then a whole set of antelope snares were found and removed. So um, you know, I had promised my students, because this was this high stakes test, that for every snare found, I would buy them a drink. At this point, they were like, OK, we, we, we don't want more anymore. <laughs> so our paper shows our hit rate versus historical hit rate and so forth. The main point is that this just started generating confidence that these machine learning approaches are going to help us in trying to find these traps. But this was a small test. So the next thing was two national parks in Uganda, six months. We, pre we made predictions over 24 separate areas. 
uh, once in Queen Elizabeth, one in Murchison Falls National Park. The rangers were unaware as to which of these areas are high risk and which are low risk. So we predicted some of these areas are high risk areas, more snares will be found. Some of these will be low risk areas, less number of snares would be found. And for six months, the rangers went out and the question was at the end, what, what, the, what would the results be? And indeed, where we predicted that more snares would be found, high risk areas, more, risk, uh, more snares were found in Queen Elizabeth. In Murchison Falls, there was a high, medium, and low differentiation. And again, where we pre our predictions turned to work out. Now, these are all areas which were not patrolled heavily. So we are basically going to newer areas and saying this is how you're going to be able to find snares. So this has now generated further confidence that machine learning based approaches could be the right approaches in order to try to find snares. Um, but it is my firm belief that we have to continually stress test this technology. And so to that end, we started working in Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia. So we were there last year. And these are my pictures. So this is uh, with the ranger who was formerly a Khmer Rouge soldier who has become a ranger. Other pictures from our trip, poachers being arrested. And again, we provided them our predictions on where larger number of snares would be found, high risk versus low risk. And very gratifying to see all these traps and snares being found based on our predictions. And again, where we made predictions, high number of snares were indeed found. The numbers of snares captured jumped from 2018 fivefold. And so the head of WWF Zero poaching effort, Rohit Singh, was, sent me this email saying, I'm super excited with the results. Let's get going on to other countries too. So this was like a, a really a, sh a big shot in the arm saying, we are going to move ahead now. And indeed, what's happened now is a collaboration between SMART, which is these, all these different wildlife conservation agencies coming together, Microsoft's AI for Earth, and us trying to put this tech, uh, pause software, which is the one we have generated, away, making it available to hundreds of national parks around the globe. So we are doing the final testing for this. And in April, we expect this to be released to parks worldwide. And hopefully, this would contribute to allowing us to finding a larger number of traps and thus save wildlife. Our next steps there would be then to protect forests and fisheries and others. So, so far, I've talked to you about this pipeline where we use past data to make predictions. But let's now start looking at real-time information. So this is from drones. And so this is work done with an NGO called Air Shepherd. And so we have drones. They have drones that fly in South Africa. They take infrared video at night. The video is sent to a van. There's a human being sit sitting there looking at that infrared video, trying to find poachers in, in that uh, video. So you can see they're trying to find late at night if they're human figures who would be then poachers. It's very difficult. And so assist them, we developed a system called SPOT that would automatically detect poachers and animals in this scenario. And so SPOT was delivered, so it, start, it can be tested to see if there are animals and poachers uh, in the video. So as we start doing, uh, as we start shipping this and automatically detecting wildlife and automatically detecting poachers, the idea is Air Shepherd will fly their drone, they'll SPOT the poachers, We'll spot poachers using our software. And now they'll call a ranger saying, come and arrest these poachers. The problem, of course, as I mentioned, is that we don't have enough numbers of poachers. So the probability with which the poachers may arrive may be just 0.3. That means that for a large fraction of times, yes, there are poachers, but we can't do anything about it. So what can we do? So our Collaborators uh, did something clever. So what they said is, let's do deceptive signaling. So they'll turn on lights at night as they fly the drone and fly towards the poacher to indicate to them rangers are on the way, even though there's nobody uh, there. And so they'll fly, and this is a real life video, and poachers will run away when, this, when they fly towards the poachers. The problem is that if you always try to do this, you always turn on the light and fly towards the poachers when there's nobody there. They'll figure out this is an empty threat. And so we have to be strategic in our deceptive signaling. And this 
strategic signaling, security games with optimal deceptive signaling was the PhD topic of my student, Hai Feng Shu. And so he came up with this idea where the defender knows the pure strategy and the mixed strategy, meaning the defender knows more than the adversary in these situations, and to use that informational advantage to come up with deceptive signaling. So consider a situation where we have poacher, uh, poachers who are being spotted, and now we know that the rangers are available with a probability of 0.3, with 0.7 chance there's no ranger. When the drone flies overhead, it not only knows the probability, but knows actually if there is a ranger or not. The adversary only knows the probabilities, but doesn't know really what is going on, whether in reality there's a poacher there or not. So we are going to truthfully signal to the poacher that there is a ranger whenever there's really a ranger there. So when there's a ranger, truthfully signal there is a ranger. When there is no ranger with a probability of 0.7, then, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's flying high. Uh, it's a it's, uh, fixed wing plane flying very high without sound, so it's hard to attack. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that would be a threat that we haven't uh, dealt with yet. Um, that, would, that would be a good problem, I mean, to think through. And so, 0.3, a uh, fraction of this time, we are going to now deceptively signal to the poachers that there is rangers coming when there are no rangers. So from the poachers' perspective, half of the time they know they're being lied to. But these probabilities are adjusted in a way so that even though they know that they're being deceived, it's in their best interest to run away. So essentially trying to put some credibility in the threat. And then with the remaining probability, there is no signal. So it turns out that actually adding this kind of signaling reduces the complexity of computing the Stackelberg equilibrium. So that's kind of an interesting and surprising computational result. So now, more recently, there's been an extension to this to say what, you know, we had previously assumed that we have a perfect understanding, meaning we have perfect detection of when the poachers are there. What if there is imperfection. So sometimes we have false negatives. There's, we can't detect anybody, but maybe the poachers are present. And to deal with that, we now, we, it turns out we can handle that because when there are, when there's a false negative, we can still do this kind of deceptive signaling because we know we didn't see anybody, but the poacher doesn't know whether they were seen or not. And so you use that information asymmetry to overcome some of these limitations. So there's a recent paper that we wrote at AAAI this year, which investigates this overcoming this uncertainty in our detection. Uh, there's a lot of Bollywood movies that I know that use this premise, but uh, unfortunately I, uh, I can't go into them right now. <laughs> Let me now go to uh, the big issue that I mentioned earlier, that is, not enough data. This is a common theme you'll see going, uh, cutting across the talk. So what this means is we may not learn an accurate enough model of an adversary. And so that means there may be errors in planning patrols on targets. And to handle that, we have a new approach on game-focused learning. The basic idea is that maximizing learning accuracy is not the same as maximizing decision quality. And so we want to learn to maximize decision quality directly. So here's how it's supposed to work. So let's go back to our prediction phase. So we collect data and normally in the prediction phase in the previous approaches in sort of a stage by stage approach, we would try to maximize accuracy of how valuable the adversaries consider each target to be. And this is shown by the blue shades on each target. So we spend a lot of our effort essentially trying to get the adversary estimates as exactly right as possible, and then plan patrol coverage. The problem, of course, is that in, in this patrol coverage, perhaps two of these targets have really a large effect on the defender expected utility. The other two targets actually don't. And what this means is all of the effort spent trying to get the estimates of these other two targets right was wasteful. And so if we could only concentrate on the targets that really mattered and get their estimates right, then our patrols would work out more correctly. And so this is the idea of game-focused learning. So instead of trying to maximize accuracy 
of the estimates of values of targets of adversaries, we try to, in the learning phase, maximize defender expected utility. And what this means now is that we get higher defender expected utility, higher decision quality in the end. So it's learning to directly improve decision quality rather than learning just to improve accuracy of, the, of what it is that we're trying to learn. And so in terms of, for those of you familiar, in terms of gradient descent, normally in gradient descent, we are just trying to maximize accuracy in the learning phase. Now we are going to go all the way to the decision quality where our game was solved to generate a defender expected utility and pass the gradients back all the way so that what we focus on are targets that matter. What we focus on are concentrating on lear our learning accuracy on objects that really matter. So if we look at it in terms of how this impacts our decision quality, on the x-axis is some metric of amount of data available, amount of training data available. Orange line is one when we do stage-by-stage -stage learning. The blue line is when we do this game-focused learning. And what we see is that as with limited amounts of data, the blue line is higher, meaning we reach a higher decision quality with the same amount of data when we use this game-focused learning because it's focusing its attention directly on trying to maximize decision quality rather than just trying to learn to improve accuracy. So I'll now switch to the final um, part of my talk, which is on public health. And so this is work done jointly uh, with Professor Eric Rice of Social Work. And so this was work uh, that we did in Los Angeles where there's a very large uh, num uh, number of people who sleep on the streets, 6,000 homeless youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles. One big challenge is HIV prevention. The rates of HIV amongst homeless youth are 10 times the rates of the normal house populations. So homeless shelters try to run campaigns to educate youth about HIV. You can't go and talk to each person. And so basic idea is you recruit a few peer leaders and you educate them about HIV. And the idea is that they'll talk to their friends and their friends will talk to their friends by word of mouth, information will spread. Now this is a social network being used, but this is not Facebook. This is just actual people interacting with each other. This is in computer science, the traditional problem of influence maximization. Given a social network graph G, choose K peer leaders in order to maximize expected number of influence nodes. So trying to choose these K nodes in order to make sure that largest community of uh, homeless youth gets informed about HIV. The assumption here is that information spreads via this so-called independent cascade model. So basically, you take youth A, inform him or her about HIV, and there's some probability 0.4 shown here that the adjacent youth B will be informed about HIV. Immersion in this domain, though, showed us that you know, it's difficult to estimate these probabilities. So we can model this as sampling from some distribution. So if a youth C gets informed, we sample from some distribution, so what's the chance that youth D will be informed? And we are unsure of the mean of this distribution, so we can also say we are uncertain uh, about the mean and model this as being from within some interval. So to solve this problem of influence maximization under uncertainty, we came up with this game theoretic algorithm where our algorithm is playing a game against nature. We are trying to choose a policy. We are trying to choose youth in order to spread information uh, in a maximum form. And nature is trying to choose parameter values to get our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. And the payoff here is some version of regret. So essentially, you can imagine we choose th some 12 youth in the network, and nature chooses parameter values so that this selection of 12 youth is really uh, going to cause us a lot of regret, meaning some other choice could have been better. So unfortunately, there's a very, very large number of policies. And of course, nature can have a very large range of what kind of parameter values it can set. So this is, a, again, a massive game. And just like before, you, we can use iterative algorithms to solve this massive scale game and come up and converge to an equilibrium strategy that works even though it doesn't expand all of these different strategies. So we can solve these massive scale games and converge with an approximation guarantee. There is a second problem we face, which is that we want to bring in 12 youth and educate them, but we can't bring them all in. 
we have capacity to only educate, let's say, four at a time. So we'll say, okay, we want A, B, C, D, four youth to show up. But on the way to the session, this day-long session, youth B may get arrested and their friend B prime may show up. Instead of D, some other youth E may show up. So we called A, B, C, D, we end up, ended up with some other set of youth. So when we call the next four youth, we have to fig take into account who actually showed up in the first round. This is planning under uncertainty. This is a problem that can be cast as a palm DP in AI parlance. And so essentially we try to plan for the sequential, uh, you know, this is sequential decision making un under uncertainty of which youth are going to show up. Solving these palm DPs is very difficult in general. But um, my student Amulya Yada, whose uh, PhD thesis this was focused on, uh, he figured out that there's groups of youth who go play basketball together, groups of youth who hang out on Venice Beach together, and so you can divide up this community into smaller sub-communities and solve for each sub-community separately without a significant loss in solution quality. And so with all of this, our healer program was built, and now it was time to actually test it. So we did some initial pilot testing, so this one, uh, Healer is our program, Healer++ is a second one, uh, a second version of our program. Degree centrality is the more traditional approach. Bring in the most popular youth. And now we recruited, so having recruited these youth, we selected 12 peer leaders in each case. And our social work colleagues then brought them in uh, according to this staged intervention that I mentioned and educated them about HIV prevention. And now the question was after a month, who got more information about HIV? So we are interested in the non-peer leaders, the people that we did not bring in and see how many of them got informed after a month. And the result was in the healer, in the AI cases, you can see that 75% of the non-peer leaders got informed, but with degree centrality, the more traditional approach, bring in the most popular youth, only 25% people got informed. So this was promising. But there's one obstacle here. We start out with the understanding that we have the entire social network in hand. Now, that means that our social work colleagues had to sit in the homeless shelter, trying to do surveys, trying to figure out who's connected to who. And even though it's uncertain, there's, there's uncertainty that they report, still creating that social network is not easy. So can we work with a small sample of this network? So that was the next task. Could we sample 18% of the youth, do surveys of that, those youth, and use that to figure out who are the influential youth from the community? And so this sampling algorithm we uh, generated, reported in uh, AAA 18, for example, and then showed that in simulation it worked well. But does it work well in practice? Again, we recruited 60 homeless, homeless youth, used that algorithm to select 12 peer leaders, and compared the results and found that with the sampling algorithm, even though it only sampled 18% of the network, we were still able to achieve in one month time period, the number of the percentage of non-peer leaders again matched that of having the entire social network in hand. So this is promising. We can actually sample a small fraction of the network and work with that to find peer leaders to do influence maximization. And so this then led us to our final test, which was with 900 homeless youth that was conducted over a couple of years in Los Angeles. And at the end of uh, the study, the idea is not only to find who got more information, but actually did the behavior change. And so this uh, was done using different metrics. There's a paper coming out about this. So for example, uh, this is the sampling algorithm is shown in blue. The orange line is the degree centrality arm, which is uh, to bring in the most popular youth, the control arm is without any intervention at all. And we can see that there is improvements in behavior based on the intervention that we generated here. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it can really help out a lot of, of youth. So um, more recent work is looking at reinforcement learning to try to achieve the same sampling approach. So essentially, instead of uh, our hand-drawn algorithm, can we learn the, the sampling approach, learn to sample? And we've shown that um, 
this actually leads to improvement in performance as well. This is in simulation. Uh, the final five minutes or so I'll spend on work uh, that we've been recently doing on preventing tuberculosis. This is work being done in India. As you know, tuberculosis is a disease that kills maximum numbers of people around the world. In India alone, half a million people die every year due to TB, three million are infected. And there's two problems we are focusing on. One, non-adherence to TB treatment. And the second, active case finding using social networks. I'll just quickly talk to you about non-adherence to TB treatments and then we'll end the lecture. So the challenge here is that uh, patients are supposed to take their medicine for six months, but often after a week, two weeks, or maybe a month, they'll drop off of treatment. This is not only bad for them, but it's also bad for others because now you've got drug-resistant bacteria. And so to try to prevent people from dropping off, there's now this digital adherence uh, tracking technology. So essentially, on this flap, you can see some phone numbers. So every time you open, there's a phone number. It's a random phone number. You're supposed to call that phone number. And that way, health workers know whether you have taken the medicine today or not. So on the health worker side, there's a dashboard. And you can see for different patients, 6204 didn't call on day one, but called on other days. 6214 didn't call on day four and day seven, for example. And so you have times when people called and when they didn't, and days when they didn't, didn't call. And so the way this works is if there are like 6231 didn't call for three days, time to go to their home and knock on their door and say, hey, you haven't been taking your medicine. You have to take your medicine to continue this treatment. Our job is we could, if we could predict in advance, because each caseworker has a caseload of something like 120 patients, if we could tell them in advance who's at higher risk of dropping off, then that would allow them to focus their attention on those patients. So if we could predict in advance based on the phone call patterns that these are 6214 is the highest risk patient, then the health worker could only concentrate on that. And so that's what uh, we've been trying to do. So we've got data, 15,000 patients, 1.5 million calls here. And you, know, you may get a pattern like this, patient one didn't call on day one, but called another days. Patient two didn't call on day three and five, for example. And if out of these patient phone calls, if we can predict patient two and four are the one high risk of dropping off, then the health workers can concentrate on those. So based on this data, we are able to show indeed that our model uh, increases the true positive rate, reduces the false negative, uh, uh, false positive rate. And so this is uh, something very promising. This is something we are hoping to do a trial uh, this spring and uh, our memorandum of understanding and other kinds of agreements are being put into place. So I'll skip some of, uh, some of this work. Bill Thies, who is a co-founder of Everwell and our colleague and collaborator on this work on uh, whose data we've been working with, uh, was uh, very gracious in saying that this work has a lot of potential to save lives. I'll skip uh, some of the remaining uh, slides and go to the final point I want to make. So <clears throat> to summarize here, we've been looking at how to optimize our limited intervention resources. I looked at uh, public safety and security, conservation, and public health as three challenge areas. We looked at uh, multi-agent systems reasoning and data to deployment pipeline as some of the unifying themes, as well as the interdisciplinary partnerships that we've, come, that we've had to build. And there are research contributions here in models and in algorithms in terms of Stackelberg security games, in game-focused learning, as well as beyond the models and algorithms in actually deploying these uh, solution techniques. I want to end by talking about a few lessons we have learned in doing this work on AI for social good. The most important is that it is possible to simultaneously advance AI research and focus on AI for social good. Second is that you really have to have a whole data to deployment pers perspective. It's not just about improving algorithms and writing papers. Um, it's important to step out of the field, lab and into the field in order to do this work. It's important to embrace interdisciplinary partnerships. Computer scientists alone cannot do this work. We have to collaborate with social work co colleagues, with conservation scientists and others. A lack of data is the norm. Uh, it's, and so basically, we have to assume there's going to be lack of data. And it should become part of a project strategy. And from, for AI researchers, the appeal is that AI for social impact needs to, be, needs to be evaluated differently. If we just narrowly focus on algorithms, all we'll get are papers that focus on algorithms. And so there we need to expand our sense of how to evaluate this work 
to include social impact as a part of the evaluation. So with this, I'll end, and we're very happy to collaborate here in Boston or in Bangalore to realize AI's tremendous potential in improving society and in fighting social injustice. So thank you, thank you for listening, thank you. When the, the rangers are actually, thank you. Was it examined at all when the drones turn on the light, when the rangers are actually arriving? Does that impact apprehension rates of poachers and then potentially impact the long-term effectiveness of the anti-poaching efforts? So the deception, the strategic deception strategy that I outlined is something that we haven't yet implemented. It was a, it's a proposal that we're putting forward uh, rather than the one that they're using, which is not going to work in the long run. So it's something to be determined in the future. Uh, so when you were talking about your approach, you mentioned that the data immersion pro process is very important in assigning maximum values or predicting outcomes. If you find out that any of your assumptions were incorrect or misguided, how hard is it for you to almost like restart the model and how does that affect deployment? So this uh, almost always, uh, you know, the first model is wrong and then you have to go and so I'll give you a concrete example. We were working with our friends in Malaysia, so we had worked in Uganda to generate patrols for rangers there and we used the same ideas to generate patrols for our friends in Malaysia. And so, uh, you know, we would generate patrols as this doesn't work, uh, this doesn't work. And, you know, shortest distance between two points in Malaysia is not a straight line. And so we flew from LA to Malaysia uh, and started patrolling with them. And then we suddenly realized what was going on. Because in Uganda, people could just walk in straight lines. Here is a very hilly terrain, so they really had to walk along riverbeds, along ridge lines. And so the whole patrol generation strategy had to be very different. And this we couldn't, uh, you know, sit there in our labs and just imagine that, you know, this is something that only became apparent once we visited that place. And so that's where, uh, you know, often we'll build the first model. I mean, there's many, many, many examples. Um, you know, we generated patrols for sheriff's uh, officers in LA for checking people traveling without tickets on trains. And then, how only, you know, the patrols would get executed about half and then stop. So why is this happening? And then we sent students along and said, you know, we didn't build in bathroom breaks in the schedules. And so, you know, after, after about half the time, basically, they, you know, they take a bathroom break and our schedule is highly optimized. They miss the next train. It doesn't work like that. So, I mean, so I'll end by say, you know, saying that uh, we are the first group to have built bathroom breaks in Stackelberg equilibria in game theory. <laughs> outcomes uh, could you please repeat sorry I didn't hear so as you're looking right the game theory that you're using you're choosing like you said the model um, are you developing AI to better improve the game that you actually choose better models and try different ones that even what that you wouldn't expect to the you know to the whatever situation you're looking at so when there is data like in the poaching situation indeed we are learning from that data to continually improve the game. So basically, by learning the adversary model, we get a better definition of the game, which target areas are more attractive to the poachers, and they change over time. And so more data allows us to build a better, better model over time. So is, so is that you just change the model, or is it the model that changes itself taking that into account? It's, I mean, we've built the algorithm that you know, essentially, it, it just takes the data and says, okay, this is the new model of the adversary. Um, but but in, a, in a broader sense, the game is 
something we've defined in the uh, ourselves yeah okay one final question here my fair right here in the front thank you uh, so uh, looking at a couple different examples that you showed today one of them involved um, LAX uh, and essentially uh, fixed sites so terminals uh, another involved the poachers which included you know the poachers and then they were kind of going after uh, areas where uh, these exotic animals would be one ex one question I have is thinking about a different situation where for instance uh, Marines soldiers overseas the adversary is not sometimes is focused on fixed sites other side other times uh, are focused on population centers and other times are focused on uh, the soldiers and Marines themselves so as so there's a bit of interaction there where as patrol routes change um, these um, you know IEDs and targeted attacks start to move along with them so there's a bit of a feedback loop has any uh, AI research been done on on that so the poacher trap setting and so forth follows a similar set of ideas basically so what happens is we'll patrol and they'll shift where they'll target and then we get new data and then we'll we'll use that data to come up with better patrols and they'll shift and so that's kind of the that has some similarity uh, to what you're use, saying. So it is possible to adapt uh, to an adaptive adversary. The adaptation, uh, adaptation here, though, is not, uh, it's, it's slow. It's, it's not uh, perhaps as fast as might, might be happening in a very urban setting where there's a lot of information flowing. But that would, I mean, there are some similarities to what we've done in the past there. So well, I do see that I have a couple of more minutes, so why don't we take, yeah, just. Hi, so this question is less on the technical side of AI, but more like politically. So you do a lot of good work in, in social, like how do like local government officials approach it? Not the guys on the, on the ground, but like on a higher level. Are they open to it? Are they against it? Like what's the general reaction? So it's, um, I mean, universally the, I, I, the way things begin is the first meeting is like everybody's like, uh, we don't need you, we know what to do, we, you know. Maybe there's one person who's a champion and the rest of the people are often not very receptive. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, you know, many cases we have seen this, uh, that uh, the first meeting is like, you know, you AI people, we don't need you, we know what to do. And there's sort of a fear of what is AI bringing? Is it going to take things away? And so on and so on. And so it's, we find that uh, working uh, through, you know, sort of building up this relationship, sort of understanding what the challenges are, and then finally showing that we were building decision aids that can potentially make their tasks better, easier, and so forth, leads us often that they themselves become champions of the work uh, that we've done. And so we ran a competition, AI versus human schedulers for uh, you know, scheduling patrols on trains on a counterterrorism exercise in LA. The whole thing began with, okay, you know, let's not do this, we don't need AI, uh, to slowly, finally doing this competition. And at the end of the competition, the AI system had performed better than the human schedulers. But the, the human scheduling team, the, the leader of that team, went and hugged the postdoc who was doing the AI system to, and just saying that, you know, that this is a great system and he wants it. And so I, it, it's a process we find that uh, not always, I mean, usually uh, it starts out a little bit um, antagonistically, but then slowly we seem to kind of arrive at a good understanding, the misunderstanding about what we are doing, what AI is capable of, so forth gets eliminated. I would say it doesn't always succeed. Uh, in some government agencies, uh, we've knocked on their doors many times and it just doesn't work. Um, you know, people are just not moved by and whatever, you know, the AI stay outside. And so that has also happened. I'm curious about um, what the variables are that you used in the HIV prevention um, use case in 
selecting who the true peer leaders are, who the true influencers are, given that it wasn't digitally based, it was face-to-face -face interaction based, and given that the social workers who theoretically are very embedded in that community and should know with a high level of accuracy who the true peer leaders are, they performed, their choices performed very poorly compared to yours. So I'm wondering right. what the variables are, how you collected that data, how you validated that data, and, and PS, is that scalable? Right. Okay. And so that's an excellent question. So the thing is, we only looked at the network. We don't look at other demographic variables, gender, race, nothing. It's just the social network and how, where people are located strategically in the social network. And the first, when we did the first pilot test, you know, our colleagues in the homeless shelter, um, you know, were surprised as to who we had, who the algorithm had selected as the peer leaders, because these were not the more popular youth. They were not in the center of the network. They were, you know, in the corners of the network, but they were strategically positioned in the network. And so even though they were surprised that the algorithm had picked them, and even the youth themselves were surprised, why, you know, me, but, but uh, it performed really, you know, it, performed really well. And so it seemed like what was going on previously was we were picking people were being picked to be peer leaders who are the more popular youth who are all in the center of the network. So they're all very good friends with each other. Um, but you know, that meant that the messages stayed within a small circle and didn't go to the you know, other parts of the network. And so that's where, um, in, in some sense, we could say that you know, we as human beings bring in our own biases here, the AI system brought in a more positive bias and allowed the messages to be spread more broadly. So is this scalable? I guess with the sampling algorithm, we certainly believe it is scalable. We did this test with these 900 youth. So we are hopeful that this can be applied more broadly. OK. Uh, let's please thank Professor Milin Tamba for a great talk. Thanks all for coming.